Hello and welcome to UK Versus. In the long line of having our Oceanic Regionals top cuts coming on, we are joined by Oceanic number two placement Max Lawson, who was running a very eerily similar Irwin deck to what we saw the previous couple of weeks. Uh, once again, congratulations on coming second. And how are you doing? Uh, yeah, thanks, man. I'm uh, doing really good, kind of. On an all-time high after that um, second place on the weekend it was really cool. Um, really enjoyed it, yeah. That was really good. So, what drew you to Irwin? We know that Bromberg was the only Irwin at NA. You were the only Irwin at Oceana, but there was all unique decks at Oceana, which was very cool. So, what was it that drew you to Irwin? Uh, so, I honestly have taken a break. Last time I had played was the last Pro Hero Nationals for OC, where I played Mimic. I think I got fifth in that one. Um, and then I kind of haven't played the game since then because that card store um, shut down where I am. So, I've kind of just been out of the loop. Um, but some of my mates over in Aussie said, no, you've got to come to the regionals. It's in New Zealand. You've got to be there. And I was like, okay, uh, what do I what do I play? And he says, oh, this is really cool Irwin deck I've um, been playing at the moment. So, I played Mimic into it. Uh, I felt like Mimic kind of got run over with the AOT creep and all these new cards that I haven't <laughs> seen yet. And I was like, yeah, that's dope. And he's like, yeah, it's got all these cool buttons and it's really hard to learn and play. And I was like, great, looking forward to that. So played like four or five rounds of testing two days before the tournament and then you go. So that was kind of just it. It was just really fun pumping the damage numbers. No, that makes perfect sense. And like you were saying, uh, well, we've played previously in the past, and you do like to play those long string button pushy kind of decks. I've seen, I think you've played against Deku four or five against me, where it's just like strung out six or seven different attacks in a single turn. Uh, so yeah. this kind of feels like long, along your wheelhouse, although it's a very hard deck to learn, it kind of fits immediately into your wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah, it was um, a lot of new responses and things that I had to learn. Uh, I did have a couple of warnings at the tournaments where I missed things slightly on like the timing of it and getting that in the right spot. Um, but yeah, throughout the weekend, I got it sorted out. Um, one of the big things I was attracted to, though, is even though he can just pump out the damage really quick, he's also got a really strong defense with minus two speed on face with shrewd observations as well being added on to just take away like pretty much all the speed I'd ever need. Yeah. Um, a great intellect, Smiling Titan, which was really cool. No, I was going to ask if you did come across the Smiling Titan with those massive attacks, because we saw Broberg having to play against them quite a lot. Uh, how did you handle Smiling Titan? Uh, we, yeah, as we only had one of each character, there's only one. I versed him in my <laughs> third round of the day, um, and it felt really good. The only attack he ever played into me wasn't the massive throw, which I was worried about, uh, the Colossus Titan one. I didn't have to verse that once. I got Ravages of War. Uh, and the times he played it, I had three shrewd observations up. So he'd play it on an eight, commit most of his foundations, tell me to discard, get rid of a momentum and sacrifice a foundation. I'm like, cool, I'll respond to that for minus three speed. And then I'd do Erwin's ability for minus two speed and then respond again for another minus three speed. So it felt pretty free when those came up. Yeah, because you take it off minus eight. So plus four to minus yeah. eight is, yeah, that's, that's just not working in their favor. No, it was very, very fun. I enjoyed that. So were there any changes you made between Broberg's list and your own? Uh, honestly, I didn't have time in the three or four test things. The only thing that I found annoying that I changed was I put in two finally awake. Literally, I've never seen the card. I just searched for something that lets me commit foundations. Because I often found that I would be destroying ready foundations with um, Erwin and all of his different responses, and it just felt really inefficient to me. Uh, it didn't really come up much in the weekend. I just found it was fine destroying ready foundations to get what I needed done. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, destroying ready foundations is better than losing the game, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so what was your highlight of the weekend? What really stood out for you? Um, I really enjoyed a new interaction. Um, that I learned it was quite advanced and um, the head judge there wasn't happy trying to figure out the ruling on it at the time. Uh, I think it popped up in the final as well, which was I had no foundations and drop because I just cycled. Um, I had an enormous axe on board and two immortal um, shapeshifters. Um, I played the three diff attack, the attack titan emerges, which lets me sacrifice a foundation to build a foundation of less difficulty in my drop. 
So the whole response window I did was play that. Yeah. Respond with it to sacrifice enormous axe, getting a counter with Erwin, building the top card of my deck statically. Then during that response window, respond with both immortal shapeshifters to check fives, checking an asset, and then I built in a botans off of that because it was in the same response window to resolve it. Yeah, because you respond, you trigger the, you know, as part of the cost. So before the ability is even active, you get to respond with it. I mean, well, normal set just goes off because it's static. And then you also just yeah, get yeah. to respond with all your model shapeshifters and other responses before the actual deck uh, effect checks what's in your discard. That is that is a really cool interaction. Yeah, I did that. I was like, Judge, can I do that? And he goes, uh, let me go check with Carl. <laughs> and then, yeah. Turns out I could, so I was happy with that. So how did it feel when you heard the top eight announcements or you were getting towards the late rounds and all the Akihabara guys are just sitting on the top, even though you did have like powerhouses like Adi and Uyong that were there? Yeah, um, it was it was pretty good. I've been testing with the Aki um, boys. I actually put Aki as my team name, but it just didn't update on the tournament. So I ended up versing Ewan in my first round. He got absolutely dumpstered. It was the only deck I struggled with with was Rodan that just played defensive. And I felt like if I didn't kill him turn one, I just there was no way I'd beat him because I just couldn't get through the wall. Um, yeah, that's but yeah, no, it, was, it was pretty cool. I did verse Uyong, I think, in my last round. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a cool match. He was still playing Overhaul. It was like the only deck I was familiar with. Everything else was brand new to me. Um, and I just had really good draws. Got all my twistings around. Uh, twisty as their infernos and just... To Odin, played him, that was out, pumped the damage, and it was cool. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, we. Uh, I heard Uyong was still on overhaul, and it, the organizers were saying that they were still expecting him to top. And then when I saw the top eight brackets, I was like, "Oh, it's all Akihabara. That's kind of cool." Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, it was pretty cool. Yeah. So how did you feel going into the finals? Because, like you said, this it was all Akihabara. It was all guys you tested with. So did it feel like a tense final, like something that you needed to take uber seriously? Or was it more just like, I'm going to have fun with my friend and whoever wins, wins? Uh, yeah, it was kind of just whoever wins, wins, um, which was pretty cool. Um, yeah, it was good versing Torrin on um, Ghidorah. Um, yeah, it was just good match all around, honestly. <laughs> hey, good fun watching it back as well. Yeah, it, it's been very cool to see what's going on. I, I did see a few people doing, like, a little bit of complaint that you guys were being a bit more casual. It's like, you guys are friends. Of course you're going to be a bit more casual with your when it comes to interactions. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I've tested with Tyrone a long time, so it was honestly just a bit of a good match. I wasn't expecting anything um, when I first went to the tournament, so I was just like, whatever happens, happens. I'm really happy with getting to top cuts, honestly. So That's right. So yeah. for anyone who's looking to play Erwin for this weekend, so in the next couple of days, how quickly would you say it would take a player to pick it up? Uh, you definitely have to have played the game before, but if you're a pretty knowledgeable um, on like all the different responses and stuff that comes up, uh, probably like five or six tests will give you the basic gist of how the deck goes and what you need to do. The main thing being the twisting of your infernos and your combined firepower responses with milling your own deck. Um, but if you're comfortable with that, honestly, yeah, won't take you too long to pick up and get the idea of what it's trying to do. You get a really good feel for it when you first start playing it. That makes sense. So when we had, we were talking to Bromberg about his list, he was saying that I think there was a few things he would change, uh, primarily around low blocks. How did you feel when you saw a low attack only having nine low blocks in your deck? Yeah, man, uh, I had a look at... I asked after one of the other boys there who was playing Godzilla, I was like, man, this deck is just going to get run over by a low-spamming Godzilla, and I'm going to feel really terrible about this. Um, didn't have to verse him, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, that is something I noticed when I looked at it before the tournament. I was like, man, this has only got nine low blocks on it. I am going to really be upset when I verse all these low attacks, but it didn't happen in the tournament, and something I did feel like I would have done is the deck has literally zero use for momentum. I never found myself keeping it because I don't have a single way to use it in my deck. So something I might actually chuck in would be VME, or the Vertical Maneuvering Equipment, mm. um, to help cover that weakness, which would be really cool, even as just a two-of or something like that. Yeah, help you get more speed and take, change those low, those low attacks to mids because you have an abundance of mids. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like 40 mids in it or something, right? 
40 minutes. And I mean, three of those, lo- well, so one of those lost block is Genkai's, and you never block him with Genkai's. No, I actually didn't use I did block with Genkai's. <laughs> oh, no. Genkai's. I didn't use a Genkai response once the entire tournament. I blocked with it once. Nice. But I think that's just a bit of me being inexperienced with Genkai's. I never played in that meta, so I don't know the best way to use it. And- I mean, if you never felt like you needed to use it, then it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, were you surprised there was no Izuku Midoriya's on the move, or do you feel like you guys just didn't get enough time to practice with it before the event to be able to play I it? Had li- I had literally zero practice. Well, I literally didn't even know it was a legal standard character going into the <laughs> tournament. I had no clue. I boosted it once, and we did a single Elim on the day after. Uh, one of them had it built there. Um, and yeah, it was seemed like a pretty cool control character, but yeah, I had wasn't on my radar at all for the actual tournament, but that's just because I didn't even know it was a character. That makes sense. And so, how was yeah. day two? You guys cracked out your entire event in day um, in a single day, which gave you essentially day two to just chill out, hang out, do some side events. Yeah, it was really cool because this was my first time meeting a lot of the Aki boys in person because we play online. We kind of just went into the story team, had a pretty chill time. Um, and you and who I played on the first day was a real avid basketball player. I like my sports as well, so we went and picked up a basketball and just kind of mucked around at one of the courts nearby which was pretty fun for the rest of the day before we packed up that's right yeah. uh just to cycle back you were saying in i think the last round you took on U young did you feel any like additional pressure knowing that he is the world number two even though he's not really played since season one yeah it's kind of crazy um when Uyong young first got into the game i was actually the first person he contacted and i taught him a lot of the basics we did. <laughs> so, so it kind of felt like just versing an old friend i remember him versing him back at nats when he was still really new to the scene and he um he was very nervous and like matches just versing me so it was actually just a good sense of the soldier versing him again but i yeah i missed all, I, I didn't even know he's world number two so i just went like that <laughs> yeah sure been out of the scene that much yeah he's so, one he, yeah. he got world number two uh he smashed me pretty well in worlds and all the entire time he was he wants to go to Disneyland. He's like, just lose then and go to Disneyland. Yeah, he's, he's a cool player. Awesome dude. Have a lot of time um, for Uyong. He let me stay at his place because he lives in Auckland when we hit the last ah, night. So it was really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah I, I've last year before na- our Nats, I was practicing with Uyong and Addy quite a lot and they helped me refine my midnight to the point where I could top Nats. So I've got a lot of respect for a lot of Oceanic players because primarily you guys are the ones awake when I'm trying to get my practice in. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. So, what was your toughest matchup throughout the entire weekend, throughout the entire day? Um, it'd definitely be the only one that I lost to, which was, um, like, like fully lost to, and I felt, like, really desperate, was the uh, Rodan at the start. With that defensive wall, Ewan's an incredible um, control defensive player. He'd often just play two attacks, go rejuvenating, smash second, draw two cards, and then I'd go in to attack him, and he's got eight cards in hand. Three of them are barrier shields at pretty much every time. And it's like, man, I don't I don't see how I just, like, pump through all of this damage, even with riskies and drop, and, like, two or zero infernos in hand. Yeah. It just didn't matter. And even if you're dropping the speed by two, if he's increasing it by three, four, it doesn't work out in your favor. Yes, that, uh, that interaction really sucked for me. I hated that. It was, oh, I'm going to incubating, remove this card, and just get, like, a really cool one on top, because I already had, like, my one diff or my firepower on top. And so he just set it up so he just had really good control over what he was removing for speed. So, so going off the speed battle. So going off what you said, I assume it was a void list then. So it had uh barrier shields, combined firepowers, uh rejuvenating reju- yeah, yeah, rejuvenating a big one there. Uh a lot of the just big control aspects, condescending it, explanations and stuff, just basically going, You can attack me, but nothing's really going to actually hit me. And if you do I'll just heal it up. Yeah. Yeah. And the most annoying thing I had as well is I'd build, I was like, okay, if I want to block his stuff because he makes it real fast, I need to have all my shrewd observations up ready to go so I can give that minus five speed. And every single turn I had it, I saw the execution commit them all. And I was like, oh, oh wow. Every time, like three three games in a row. It was so insane. Like testing before the Airbnb where we were, everything was always had it. That's rough, but he... It's the way it goes, and the other one that's sat at number two now. So who's the real winner? Yeah, true, true. <laughs> I was just happy I didn't have to verse him in the top four because he made it there as well. So, yeah. so, 
So how did you feel going into Ghidorah? Because like you said, you guys had practiced, you guys kind of knew what each other were playing. How did you feel about your matchup into Ghidorah going into it? Uh, I, so I played a lot with Torrin. I hadn't versus Ghidorah at all. I literally haven't even really seen the character. So I was like, this guy's got 10 health. This is really weird. And then I had a read of the, uh, read of the character. I'm like, oh, I just got like this three head mechanic and stuff. So that was all pretty new to me. Uh, Evil Symbol something I played before with Mimic when I did the Mimic deck, so some of it was like sort of familiar. I really like the um, Teen Health interactions on it, which was really cool. Things like dissolving and getting plus one, minus one, all of those cards. Um, but yeah, I think it was just a, a matchup I should usually win, looking at it. Like I can just pump really good damage and get a whole head and not have any of the problems with damage reduction. But yeah, cards just went there at the time, so didn't manage to get through it. That makes sense. I mean, the Ghidorah matchup is kind of a coin flip. If he gets his defensive pieces out, if he gets the minus one speed to all your attacks and like the plus three speed to all of his attacks out, mm. if he sets it, kind of like the Rodan situation where, but instead of having the crack back with speed, it's more the control aspect of you're not touching me unless I want you to kind of aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he had um, really good control of the board there. Um, which was cool, but yeah, the Rodan definitely felt super oppressive compared to it. The minus ones were a lot easier to deal with than just like a minus four or minus six at times, so yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, how do you feel about the announcement of worlds being sealed? As in, uh, people yeah. can't really, as in, no other people than the invited people will be part of the event. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't even seen the announcement, so it's just this to me. I do not keep up to date with anything, honestly. Um, but yeah, I guess interesting. I think universes should try and get as many people there as possible, honestly, if they're keen to do it. I know it makes the tournament run a bit longer, but more the merrier for me, honestly. I'm always there for a bit of a fun game, and yeah, getting more people in sounds better to me, honestly. That makes a lot of sense. So, are you going to be rocking up to Nats in January? Uh, yeah, the Aki boys have been trying to convince me to go. I was like, look, boys, I haven't got any cards since set five or anything, so if you want me to go, you build the deck. I'll test the online, and we'll figure it out, and then, yeah, we'll see what we can do. So, uh, just still 50-50 at the moment, but hoping to. Just rock up with a solo leveling challenger deck unedited. Looking forward to those cards. The one announcement I did see, solo leveling, very cool anyway. So, oh, looking forward to that. I am... Absolutely loving it. I've got my soul leveling dagger ready to go. We've just got the soul leveling vinyl from Crunchyroll. Big soul leveling fan household. And I'm really hoping that his yeah. character is very playable because I really want to rock up to Nats and just be yeah. be playing that skill tree. Yeah, there's definitely going to be some level up mechanic in it. Like, I'm of calling it now. By the way, it was announced that he's got a, a, a separate skill tree card. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's that sounds insane. Playing a. RPG and game, all right, bet, let's do it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, have you seen any of the other announcements of the IPs coming next year after so long? <laughs> nope. Uh, cool. Nothing. So we, uh, let's see what you're most hyped for. So in March, we're getting Critical Role set, which is a 10-year anniversary set. Uh, that's Matt Mercer and stuff, eh? Hey? Yes, that's the right. Matt Mercer voice actor D&D sort of thing, and also the hit yeah. Amazon okay. Prime Show. Yeah. Then we've got, after that, uh, Attack on Titan Apocalypse, which is the final okay. of the three sets we're getting for Attack on Titan. Yep. Oh, it is good. Yep. And then after that, we're getting TMNT. Uh, yep. Haven't heard of that one, but yep. Let's keep it. Teenage Ninja Turtles. Oh, I can't have heard of that one. Right? <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a show like two months or something. No, no, no. Like, we're, yep. we're, we're getting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in August. Then cool. we're getting yep. a Street Fighter Six Challenger. Okay. Yeah. And the last one we're getting in November will be Guilty Gear. Yeah, I haven't heard of that one, unfortunately. It's like an but... anime style fighting game similar to Tekken and Street Fighter okay, stuff. Cool. And we haven't right heard any of the, we haven't heard any of the other challenges yet, but are any of those piquing your interest? Yeah, I mean more AOT card sounds fun, especially if they're themed around. I kind of am a big fan of just seeing how the cards synergize together. Spend a lot of time deck building at work when I should probably be working. <laughs> um, yeah, so AOT is probably a highlight for me, and yeah, the Ninja Turtles as well will be 
pretty cool, I think. I'm very happy for these titles. Just dropped a theory video on where I thought they were coming from, and next week I have another theory video where I think I've actually found where we're going to be pulling the source material from, because everyone seems to think it's Mutant Mayhem, the most recent movie, but I think mm-hmm. it's something else, and it's, I, I think I'm pretty sure I'm bang on, but we're not here to talk about the future IP, we're here to talk about you. All right, cool. <laughs> so one of the big questions that has been floating around on Facebook and other areas was asked by UVS themselves, and it's how can UVS improve your player experience? Um... I'm going to be honest, I haven't uh, had too much to say. This is my first time back from the tournament. Um, I like the new website. I thought that was cool. took me a while to figure it out, but that's just because I haven't used it. Um, it looked pretty clean. I liked it. Um, tournaments were easy to check like on my phone, which was really cool. So it was props to them for that. Um, improving player experience for me personally would just be ease of access to events, um, especially now that I just don't have a card store locally where i am i have to travel like two or three hours if i want to go to a card store or locals night um which is yeah being handed something that i could do at home on a computer online whether that be but like a tabletop thing is what i use a lot um would be really cool but it's just the big thing i'm hoping for is that ease of access yeah yeah so as well as good as it is to be having more star events the lack of webcam and lack of online play is being felt by people in remote regions yeah yeah. It is. That kind of makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm in kind of a similar boat. My closest stars are two hours away, and it's great to travel out and do demo days and interact with the community. But doing that every single week or multiple times a week does get very draining. Yeah, and drains the bank account too. So. And just drain the bank account, yes. But just having something like free and easy to access would be cool. So like a tabletop tournament or something, even if it's just casual. But just having. But we do have list. the Let's Talk UVS Tam Carwell webcam circuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, UVS will never be able to publicly endorse Tabletop Simulator, you know, yeah. licenses and whatnot. But it would mm-hmm. be very cool to just have some kind of online access back, even if it isn't to the extent we had it before, because that does encourage the cheating and the underhanded stuff. It's just some kind of casual one that's just great for people to come and play and just get the experience. Experience. Yeah. That, that makes perfect, perfect sense. Uh, did you know that UVS? Well, and did you know the game was demoed at PAX Australia? Uh, yes, I did hear that. Um, I actually had one of my mates who was doing that. He was there and he was bragging about getting all the new set early. It was around Heroes Clash, eh? No, uh, this was a couple weeks ago. Okay, so they've done it again. That's cool. I yeah. know he definitely did it around set three as well. Yeah, the, uh, uh, I don't know if you know Bailey. I heard the name. Yeah, Bailey, who got top four at the last nuts, was mm-hmm. at uh, PAX AUS a couple weeks ago, and they were doing demo days, and he told me that on the first day, it was just eight hours of pure demoing, so there is a lot of interest for the game out there. It's just okay. getting stars involved. Mm-hmm. It is a huge shame to hear about Grimdark going down, but and Akiba basically being the closest one for a lot of those players, which is two, three hours away, because people forget Australia has the same is the same size as the circumference of the moon. Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> it's very big. So, as Oceanic number two for this season, do you have any tips or advice for any of the UK players going into their regionals this weekend? Um, have fun with it, but remember your responses is probably the takeaway from that. Yeah, don't stress yourself out and just... Yeah. I believe makes, you're going to draw your best hands when you need it, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So I'll let you get off because it's getting quite late over there. It's so what's approaching 8, 9 p.m. Uh, yeah, going close to 10 now. Yep. Really close to 10, jeez. Have you got any last words or any shout-outs you'd like to give to the community? Uh, just shout-out to the Aki boys. Again, you and KJ, uh, Tyra and Kai and Mark. Awesome to meet you guys and really enjoy testing and, um, you know, just having a cool tournament last weekend. So thanks for that. And a huge shout-out to Keandre and Carl for helping run the event and keeping it already smoothly. And, of course, massive props to Carl for getting his stream together, essentially, in a week with great commentary and just very well organised. Yeah, yeah, did run pretty smoothly. Yeah, 
from the stories I heard about season one, this one seems to have gone a lot smoother than the season one one. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, well, thanks for the interview, my friend. I'll let you get off and get uh, get the last things we've done before you head off to bed. And I'll, Sweet, thanks, man. I'll catch you in a bit. Okay, see ya. Later. Bye.